Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. We're in week three, and in this mini lecture, we're going to be going through four examples of linear calibration of data sets. The best way to see this lecture is to, of course, once you see the problem on the screen before I've started, go ahead and stop the video, try to work it yourself, and then check your work against mine. So this is a pretty classic kind of single point calibration problem. And one of the challenges with this problem is you have to translate it, because what it's really asking you to do is your detector will be damaged above a milliamp. So you want to know how much lead can you put into the system and not get above a milliamp. Often problem solving is really reading. So let me restate the problem. Now let's remember back to what a calibration curve looks like. We know that calibration curves should be linear and that as we increase the concentration of a substance, we would increase our signal. That signal might be millivolts, it might be in amps. In this case, it's in milliamps. And luckily, we've been given some standard data. We know that 0.1 molar, 0.100 micromolar lead gives 0.0064 milliamps. So right away, we have a reference or a standard data point, which is going to let us calculate the slope of this line if we also assume that zero is the true zero. That's an assumption, which is why a single point calibration is really not accurate, but it's at least a start. So let's go through this problem. What this problem boils down to then is to calculate the slope of the line first, and we're going to do that using our blue data sets. So this is just delta y over delta x, rise over run. Here it's going to be 0 0.00654 milliamps minus zero milliamps. Remember, that's our second data point. And then we're going to divide that by 0 0.100 micromolar minus zero micromolar. You put all that together and you can calculate a slope of 0 0.0654 milliamps per micromolar. What this is called, I'll sometimes call it the IRF or the RF which is a bad name. These are both variations. Right. Then now we've done this. Now we have to think about our unknown information. So what you have to realize is that our unknown is this. How much lead will give us a milliamp of signal? So the second part of this problem then is to rearrange this expression so that we can calculate the concentration of lead that's what we want after all in our unknown and we're going to get it from this one milliamp of signal and we're going to do so by using our instrument response function so for one milliamp we know that's going to be corresponding we're going to divide by the IRF and we get this nice unit analysis the milliamps cancel and what you can find from this is a concentration of lead of 15.3 micromolar. And so the important things to remember about this problem are a couple of things. So remember, in a single point calibration, zero is really equal to zero. And that's important to remember. And don't freak out about sig figs, because this is, after all, an estimate. Let's move on. This is really similar to the last problem, except you have a, a, a sort of trick in that you have dilutions to deal with. So let's start off by identifying what's our standard. So in this case, we are measuring a standard solution where we're given a concentration and we find a voltage. So to some extent, our standard information is here. And from that, we're going to calculate the slope or the instrument response function. But we have a complication here because we have a dilution. So how to think about this then is we started with the solution that's 1.677 molar. But we took 5 mils of this and we put it into 100 mils. So what this means is we, in effect, diluted the sample by a factor of 20. And that's something we're going to have to immediately account for. We need to know the concentration of the actual standard that gave rise to this signal. And as you can see, it's not this more concentrated species. So to do that, you have to remember M1V1 is equal to M2V2, which just says that all the moles in this final solution had to come from this solution. So we're going to be calculating the molarity final, and it's going to be equal to 1.677 molar times 0 0.005. That's the portion we removed. And we're going to be dividing it by the final volume here. And from that, we're going to calculate, there we go. 
Okay, so that's step one. Now, step two is very much like what we've done before because now we're going to find the instrument response function. So as you can see, we get a number which is the millivolts per molar for lead, which in this case is a pretty big number. I wrote that in scientific notation just to be clear that I'm carrying three significant figures in this calculation. Finally, now we're going to be connecting to our unknown because here's the information about our unknown. We know that it gave us a signal of 321.2 millivolts. So let's right away get the concentration that gave us 321.2 millivolts. So find concentration for 321.2 millivolts. To do that is just to go ahead and do what we've done before. We know that's going to be equal to our signal times the instrument response function, which in this case gives us now a solution concentration 0.263 molar. But, and this is a big but, just like we diluted up to make our standards, we also diluted our unknown. And if you read about what we did, the solution concentration we need to report, which is our unknown, we took, except this time we took it into 50 mils here. So now what the problem is, is we know that this is 0.263 molar, and now we have to figure out the concentration that that came from. So all of the moles in the measured solution came from 5 moles of the unknown. So that's how we're going to do it. We're going to go M1V1 again is equal to M2V2, except now we're going to be calculating M2, which is our unknown, as being equal to 0.263 molar. That's M1 times 50 mils. So that's the total number of moles in our measured solution. And all of that came from 5 milliliters or 0 0.005 liters of our unknown. And you put that all together, that's a tenfold dilution. So the actual unknown is 10 times more concentrated than what we measured. Okay, let's do calculation and error. So this is going to be a much more complicated uh, kind of problem because not only do we have to do what we just did in the past problems, meaning we have to estimate our slope and then we have to calculate the signal, but we also have to deal with the error, which are just some, uh, it's not hard math, it's just a little bit ugly. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do here is notice this is not a single point calculation because I've given you more than one point. And so it sort of behooves you to calculate a couple of slopes. And so if you have Excel, as you're going to see in the last example, we're going to can do that in a spreadsheet. But real quickly, let me just go ahead and calculate two slopes. Okay, so there's our estimate. Notice that I took the, a couple of data points. I took this one and this one to compare, and then I compared this one to this one. When you're estimating slope, you can sort of pick any two that you want. Just try to, if you've got a calibration data set, take at least two points to estimate your slope. These are in pretty good agreement. Okay, now the next thing we have to do is we actually have to use the fact that we have 6523 millivolts in our unknown. So we're going to have to use our slope and our signal, unknown signal, and we're going to from that get X0 or the concentration of lead in the unknown. This is like what we've been doing before. The concentration of lead is equal to the signal. Now we have to worry about calculating it. So you have to remember that we need SX0. And this is going to be SYX over the slope times 1 plus 1 over N, where N is the number of calibration measurements, times what I'm calling the third term. It's Y0, the signal and the sample we're interested in, minus the average Y of the calibration curves, divided by the slope squared times the statistics SXX. And all that is going to be taken to the 1 half. So, in doing this calculation, getting this third term, so the top is 6523, that's our Y0. We're going to subtract from it what I have as my average, which I think is 8150. We're going to square it. Then we're going to divide it by the slope I calculated, 44.7 squared times my SSX statistic. Now, fortunately for us, I was nice, and I let, gave you that. And so that's going to go right here. And when you put all that together, you're going to be calculating a third term equal to 0 
7181. Now, finally then, we're going to calculate our SX0, and that's just going to be equal to our SYX, 173.8, divided by 44.7, 1 plus 1 over 5, plus our third term, everything to the 1 half power. And when I calculated that all out, I got 4.27 parts per billion. Now, that's a good start. That gives us x0. And the last thing we now have to do is figure out what's the error bar. Because remember, going from the standard deviation to the error bar requires that we use the confidence limit. And we're going to use the same formula, which is t for 95% confidence limit and a certain number of degrees of freedom. Now here, an important thing to remember is the degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1 if y intercept equal to 0. And it's equal to n minus 2 if you solved for y intercept and slope. So that brings up an interesting question in this estimate. Should you use the n minus 1? Did we set the y intercept to 0? Or should you use the n minus 2? Since we didn't do a full linear calibration on this, I'm going to opt for using this one. Um, it's kind of a, a, a fuzzy thing to do because almost always you would have done this mathematically and used all your data points because I'm trying to teach you how to do it by hand. I decided that the right way to go is to do an n minus 1 as if we had assumed a y-intercept was equal to 0. So in that instance, we're going to go to a t-table and look up the 95% degree of freedom. And in this case, we're going to look up 4. I get that to be 2.78. So when you multiply these two numbers together, you can get the final answer. OK, so now we're going to go to Excel. In this last example, I'm going to give you a spreadsheet and show you how I developed that spreadsheet to get all of the answers to the questions we've been talking about. So let's take a look. OK, so here we are with an Excel sheet. And what I've done is this is a different set of Chromium data, so don't get confused. It looks different because it's a different kind of instrument. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven measurements. And the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and calculate the slope and the intercept of this. So normally, and some calculators can do this too, but most of you will be using some sort of spreadsheet. To get the slope, remember the equal sign is just telling us it's a function. There's our slope. There's our x values, our y values, and there we have it. Now we're going to do intercept. And we're going to do the same thing. So unlike the by hand approaches where you pretty much can't get your y-intercept, when you do it fully, you totally get your intercepts as shown here. Okay, so that's the first step. We have the slope and the intercept. Remember, this value is our instrument response function. Okay, so I suppose the next thing we can do is come down here and calculate what the unknown concentration is for our signal of 1189. OK, so the only difference here is that we're going to be taking this value and subtracting from it the intercept. So before, we were just taking the signal and dividing it by the slope. Here, we have to subtract out the intercept first. There we have it. That's supposed to be the concentration of our unknown, so we're halfway through this problem. OK, but now we have to worry about the statistic. And since you're using Excel, you have to actually figure everything out. This is easy because it's the function s-t-e-y-x. And if you type that in, you're going to get that statistic that we just, standard deviation of the estimate that it's called. Now, it's not the final standard deviation. It's actually the standard deviation in the y values. The SSX statistic has this really interesting characteristic. So the SSX statistic is actually the standard deviation of all the y values squared times n minus 1, which in this case is just going to be 6. There it is. There's our SSX statistic. Now, term three is a little bit complicated. It's what we just went through. So I'm going to sort of talk it through as I calculate it. Term three 
is going to be equal to my y signal. So this is my unknown signal minus the average signal, quantity squared. That's the top. The bottom is the slope squared times the SSX statistic. There's my third term. Okay, now I got to calculate SX0. And so that's going to be the standard deviation of the estimate divided by the slope times 1, because we only have one measurement apparently, times 1 over the number of calibration experiments, which in this case is 7, and then plus our term 3, which is right here. There we have our SX0, and this is going to, of course, be in units of ppm. Now, what I like to do when I do these is to make a table. So down here, we're going to have a table where I'm sort of reading in all of my calculations because it's good to have them all in one place. And you can type them in here if you want. There's my SXY. There's my third term. There's my number of measurements. Now, we're assuming we've only done one replicate. And so our SX0 value is going to be given by this. Now. In this case, to convert to an error bar, we have to use a five degrees of freedom. And the reason is that we regress to get both the slope and the intercept. So in effect, we've lost two degrees of freedom by building this model because we have two variables or two constants that came out of it. So the rule is when you get the intercept and the slope, you use n minus two for your degrees of freedom. That's why I'm using that here. And the t value that I pulled for a degree of freedom of five, and a 95% confidence interval is 2.57. So if you multiply all that together, you're going to get 18.13 as your error. OK, so that's an example of running through an error calculation. I want to make one last sort of illustration and say, what if you were to use three replicate errors? Well, we should see their error go down. So if I our unknown value. So we have a 9.6% error if we have three replicates. And we have what should happen here. We should see it go down. There we go. If we did six replicates, we have an 8.4%. Now, a question is, why don't we use the standard deviation on the replicate measurements? And like I said in lecture, when you do these um, statistics, we've already, in effect, propagated the error of the AES signal that we measured for our unknown. So we're not doing a weighted linear regression. If for some reason the error that you got on your own known was very different than the error that you got in the signal you measured on your calibration standards, then you would have to apply a different analysis. But because we assume the error is basically all the same, that error is in effect propagated in the formula that you're using. So you don't need to worry about the standard deviation of the replicates. We've already made that assumption. Let's see how good we can go. Let's do 10 measurements. We get down to 7.8. And as you're going to see, if we did 100 measurements, we don't buy that much more. And that's sort of the, the law of diminishing returns. As you take more and more replicate measurements, we went to 7. So you can see 1,000, 7.1 for 100. There's 10. What we're doing is actually figuring out that it goes as square root of n, uh, which is a very common way to see replicate error improve as you get more and more data. So eventually, you start hitting the flat part of that curve. And it gets a modestly better, but as you take more and more, eventually, it really doesn't. Uh, you don't get nearly as much out for what you put in, in terms of improving your error. OK. OK, with that, that was all I wanted to do on the examples. I hope you got something out of them. Uh, please go ahead and practice these again on your own. And I'll see you next time.